So today we are talking about design patterns, namely structural design patterns. So whenever you think about designing an architecture for your software, for your system, for your service, structural design patterns will help you to plan for the future, arrange classes in neat hierarchies and have them talk to each other without too much tight coupling. Right, but if you're new to software development and you don't really know what software design patterns are, be sure to check out this video over here and have a quick introduction. All you need to know when you start with structural design patterns is basically how they look like, what are they called and more or less what they do. You don't need to know everything in depth. This is an introduction. It will help you navigate the strange and unknown land of structural design patterns. So don't worry. I'm here with you, I will guide you, and let's begin. Let's get into structural design patterns. We have seven of those. And these are adapter, bridge, composite, decorator, proxy, facade, and flyweight. Let's start with adapter. So adapter is also known as a wrapper and when do we actually need an adapter? Well, the most common case that justifies usage of adapter is when you have an interface that doesn't match the interface that you require. So for example, you have class A that has some interface and it's almost matching interface B, but not really, there are some slight differences. And for example, you have a legacy code or a library third-party library that you need to adapt to your code so it fits nicely and well what do you do you come up with an adapter in order to create an adapter we need to do one thing first we need to declare that our adapter will implement this given interface that we are adapting to right now all we have to do is well wrap wrap the object that we are going to be adapting we can do it two ways one way is to inherit from this object and do it privately. So no fields or methods from this adapted object are exposed outside of our adapter class. Or we can use composition and we create this object in a constructor of our adapter and then we assign it to a field. And the second step is to actually implement all of the methods that this adapter has to implement in order to adhere to this interface that we are adapting towards. And in those implementations of these methods, we just basically call the methods of the adapted object. All right, that seems easy. This is adapter. All right, number two is bridge, also known as body or handle. So this design pattern is meant for you to allow you to separate the implementation from the abstraction. Oftentimes when we design a system or application, we come up with some layers, right? We have the persistence layer and upper layer like business layer. And sometimes we don't really want to know how the lower layers will handle whatever we throw at it. One case may be that we want to store an actual database or a flat file or somewhere else. And maybe another case may will be when we want to run some tests and we want to store the memory, right? Or pull it from the memory. And we want to allow the lower layers to be totally separate. So we don't care how this particular action is implemented, but we only know that, okay, this is the thing that we want to do. And this is the object that will handle this. Bridge actually decouples the actual implementation from abstraction layer that will be using this particular implementation. So we come up with two structures. First will be abstraction class and second will be the implementation interface. Abstraction class can only be constructed with implementation as a parameter. We take this implementation and we store it as a reference. Now, whenever we call the abstraction method, we will use the reference to implementation to actually do stuff that we want, that we require. And now we can have multiple concrete implementations that we can later pass 
as a parameter to constructor of our abstraction class. All we have to do is provide some methods of our abstraction. And then we can inherit from this class, let's say, different kinds of our abstraction layer, right? So we can use the bridge to determine what kind of concrete implementation we need during the runtime, right? and we don't need to know it in advance during the compilation time. Bridge basically decouples the implementation from the actual abstraction that is going to be using that implementation. And it is important that both of those layers can be developed and extended um, separately, right? You don't need to add anything from one layer to the other. And for example, if you have massive solution in C++ that would require you to recompile every single piece of code whenever you change something in implementation, you don't have to do it. Because basically all you have to do is relink. And just linking is of course much, much cheaper. All right, let's go with composite now. Composite is actually a very nice design pattern, one of my favorites. And when do we use the composite design pattern? Well, whenever we have any sort of tree-like structure, when we have multiple leaves and we want to store them in relation to their parents, to their roots, to their nodes. The easiest possible example is we have a box of merchandise. We have some sort of giant box. And in there, we have smaller boxes of stuff and in there we can have even more boxes. And now we want to, let's say, add the value of all of these boxes, add the price together. So instead of going into all of those boxes and fetching them somehow or storing them in some weird way, what we basically do is we come up with a common interface. Let's call it component or a box. And this interface will provide a single method for now. You can have more, of course. So one method and this method will be getPrice. And this interface will be implemented by two classes, a composite and an actual concrete box, which could be whatever, right? And the concrete box will, of course, implement the method getPrice, right? It will give us some value, something. So all the stuff happens in the composite class. It will use this interface that we provided, right? And it will store references to these boxes. And now we have a couple of methods to manage those boxes, those interfaces, add child, list children, remove child, and so on and so forth. So how we are going to implement get price for our composite? Of course, we are going to iterate over every single child in this composite, call get price on it and return a sum. So basically we are delegating all the work to children and the important thing is that because composite is implementing the box or the component interface, and now we can have multiple nested composites as children of our main root composite. Easy enough, very pleasant to use and simple to learn. All right, what do we need? What do we need? We need decorator, that's it. So decorator in its structure is very similar to composite. But the difference between the decorator and the composite is the purpose. Why do we use decorator and why do we use composite? So composite, as I mentioned before, is some way of storing tree-like structure, right? We have multiple leaves and they are doing something together. Maybe they are counting the price or whatever. But decorator, well, this is different animal. It's used to extend existing class with new functionality without inheritance. For example, we have a button, right? We have a button and we may want to draw it differently, depending on whatever user is requiring during runtime. We don't know ahead what kind of button we are going to create. Maybe we are going to create a button with a border, maybe a button with an image or a text. It can be everything, we don't know. And important thing is, that we don't want to call all of the possible functions in order to determine, oh, will this button be a drawing border or an image or text? We don't know. We don't want to worry about that. So what do we do? We come up with decorator. So decorator will extend existing functionality without the limit of possible extensions. So you can have a border, another border, and border on top of that. So let's take a look how the decorator is implemented, how it's built, exactly as in composite design pattern, we have a common interface, 
uh, component. So this component provides some method, for example, draw, right? And then we have a concrete class that is used to, well, it's our root. So at the end, it's, it's, for example, can put stuff on the screen, right? It has some internal buffer and it contains the picture of the button. So we want to extend this drawing with something, right? We want to have multiple ways of drawing this button. So we create a component decorator class and component decorator class will store the reference to the actual component. Component decorator also implements the component interface. So you can have nested references of component decorator, referencing component decorator, referencing component decorator, referencing the actual concrete component. Now we can inherit from component decorator and override the function that we want to change. For example, the draw function that we were talking about. So whenever we are done with drawing, we just call the referenced function on the same name. And this way we create a chain of calls that will propagate from the root component up to the node to the last concrete component. And in this way, we can have a chain of multiple interchangeable decorators during runtime. We don't need to know in advance what kind of button we are going to create, what kind of window, what kind of icon or whatever else. We can give it a border, we can give it anything. All it has to do is to agree to implement this component interface. And that's it, that's the decorator. Simple enough. So what is a proxy design pattern? Well, nothing else but a wrapper around a method on different object. It allows you to add some extra steps before or after the call to that object. And why do we need such a wrapper? Well, it's easy. We want to add extra steps before or after this call for possible different reasons. One of the options that we may want is logging or maybe we want access control, for example, based on query object that we pass to this method, right? If the object is in a concrete state, we then call the method, otherwise we don't. Maybe we want some sort of lazy loading. For example, we never create that object unless the method is called. Perhaps we want to call a remote service, get some remote data, maybe over internet or maybe over a serial port, whatever. Perhaps we want to store and cache the results of these methods. Maybe we, we will store a list of queries and then we will store cached values. And proxy is not really very complex in its nature. All you have to do is have a common interface, right? We, it has to have some method that will be proxied with our proxy. We have an actual concrete class that implements this interface and we come up with our proxy that also implements this interface and does, 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 and does some additional steps here uh, that we require, right? So logging, caching, whatever. All of that can be done with your proxy and that's all there is to it. Proxy is pretty simple, very useful. I highly recommend you start using proxies as much as you can. So what is a facade? Facade is a structural design pattern that allows you to simplify um, usage of some complex system. So for example, we have a lot of classes, some obscure hierarchy or uh, some special way of creating an object and you don't want to expose all of that to users, right? Or perhaps you are wrapping a third party library and you will be only using some subset of all that, right? Or some certain way of creating of these objects, right? And you want to protect the end user, the client from all of this mess. You want to hide it as much as possible so the client doesn't have to worry about how to create this weird chain of classes or whatnot. So what do you do? You create a facade. So create a object that contains methods that are named nicely. They basically describe in broad abstract way what do they do and then you fill them with whatever you need and store the references to your messy tangled web of classes and objects. It's pretty neat design pattern, I would say, but it comes with a risk. Basically, um, if you overuse it or use it in the wrong way, you may create a god object which knows about all of your types. It uh, 
it is tightly coupled with the entire system and it's really hard to kind of change it and you don't want that. Having that said, remember that you can use facade to manage lifetime of your objects. So you can create and destroy them as you please, as you need. Facade and that's it. All right, flyweight. Flyweight is design pattern that is also known as cache. And I think this is actually more, more common name that is currently used. So what do we, when do we need cache or flyweight? For example, when we have a lot of common information that is shared across many objects, and this information is, well, bigger than a reference, basically. The easiest example I can think of is um, a game. And we have uh, images of sprites or whatever, uh, creatures and tiles and something like that. So whenever we create a new tile and we have the same image that we are going to be using to display this particular tile, we don't want to store the copy of exact same image in every single uh, tile, right? We only want to store a reference to the image and perhaps position on the screen on something else and there's something else with the position of the screen this, these values are called unique state so unique state is something that belongs to our flyweight of course we are saving RAM a lot of it by using cache but at the same time we are paying a little price a little bit of price by dereferencing all of the calls that are going to this uh, cache right to the cached object so how are we going to build this cache flyweight thing? Well, of course we need the image or the cached object or whatever, cached value. So we have this common thing, we have the flyweight that will store the reference to it, and we have a factory. And the factory will be, well, our broker. Flyweight common factory that will give us, provide us the references to the cached objects, cached values, cached images, whenever we provide a correct ID to the factory, right? So the factory consists basically of two things. One is a field that will store all of the references to all of the cached values, the cached images or whatnot. And this field most likely will be a map. And the second thing is a method, get flyweight common or something like that, that will accept the ID of this image of this cached object and will use the map that it has to basically return a reference to our cache. Simple. And whenever we create a flyweight object, we pass our unique state, the position on the screen, the health, whatnot, and we pass the cache ID, the ID of our common flyweight object to retrieve our appropriate image reference. And that's basically it. So whenever we need to use um, our cached value, we uh, use the reference or we use uh, factory to get the reference if we don't have it yet. And that's how Flyweight works. And that's all. These are structural design patterns. They are way easier than they seem. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, share, like, comment down below. And remember, I'm going to have another video on behavioral design patterns very soon. If you want to know about that, do subscribe to this channel. Be sure to click the bell icon that is next to this subscribe button, because otherwise, most likely you won't see the video on your feed because, yeah, that's the way things go on the YouTube land. So click that bell and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.